that. Hello everyone and welcome to this series of short videos with a covering really an introduction to data analysis for stable isotope data. Um, my name is Brian Hayden. I am a system professor at the University of New Brunswick and I run the Stable Isotopes in Nature Laboratory there. My research background is mostly aquatic ecology, but really focusing on applications or well, rather, rather, let's say I, um, I use stable isotopes as a tool. A lot of my research looking at interactions between different fish species. Um, so in this series of short videos, we're going to go through the be a paired sort of I'm going to give a little demonstration and I will provide the, the source code and the files and things like that that I use. We're going to go through some of the, the basics of how to plot out some isotope data, interpret some of those plots, and then run on to do some corrections to the data where necessary, some mixing models, some simple mixing models, and some more complicated mixing models. We'll look at the isotopic niche the um, from the, the cyber stuff and also the isotopic food web. This series of lectures is really just going to focus on the nuts and bolts of how you do the work, how you write the script and run the different things and make make it all happen. We will have a, a second series of lectures during the uh, the Survivor's Guide to Stable Isotope Ecology course that really focuses in on the on the trickier part of this, which is sort of interpreting the results you get back out of it. OK, so without further ado, what I wanted to do was just give you a little bit of background in what we're going to be talking about in, in this data, rather than throwing a load of data at you. I just want to show you sort of where this data is coming from. We're going to have one sort of data set that we're going to do all of this work with. Yeah, and I'm going to share my thingy here now. And with a bit of luck. Bing, bing, bing. We should now be seeing trophic dynamics in subarctic Europe. So this is the sort of the an area or a, an area I worked in for a couple of years as a postdoc and um, did a, a lot of research looking at interactions between different fish species. Here on the top we have the Eurasian, Eurasian white European whitefish, and below we have the uh, the perch Eurasian perch. And these are two distinct species that live in in lakes in well, really throughout Europe, but throughout sort of northern temperate Europe. And this research, whoops, to me. So this is a, the story sort of behind behind this data is really a an, a European story or a northern European story. So right up here, this is we've got um, Norway, Sweden, Finland. I was living down here in Helsinki, but a lot of this work happens up here in Lapland, up here where the, the three countries meet here. And this is a, a region, if you're a, a freshwater ecologist, it's one of the most awe-inspiring places that, that you get to work. This is Lake, Lake Kilpisjärvi up here. There's a beautiful, pristine, clear water lakes. And they're home to some beautiful, beautiful species of fish. We've got things like Arctic char down here, brown trout, um, the white fish, and some grayling. Lots of different sort of salmonid fishes that are specialized for this or well adapted for these cold conditions. So we've got uh, what's termed as sort of a clear state lake. The majority of the production, we've got a brief window of sort of pelagic pulse of, of phytoplankton and zooplankton, but for, for the majority of these lakes are fueled by, by benthic algae, which fuel gastropods or the benthic invertebrates, fuel for benthic fishes, moves on up through the food chain. The lakes can be subdivided into three distinct habitats. We've got a littoral or a shallow water zone, a pelagic or open water zone and someplace in North America here we might call these um, near shore and offshore. But from this context we're talking about littoral and open water being pelagic. The cutoff here is the, the compensation depth. Essentially beyond this depth there is not sufficient light to stimulate photosynthesis. So but there is still life down here 
There's still a community of invertebrates and, and fishes which feed on them. And piscivorous fishes also which feed on those fishes. But this region requires, there's no primary production, so it's fueled by detritus either cascading down from the littoral zone or dropping down from, from the pelagic zone. But we will see later on that when we think about how we're using isotopes to, to quantify these systems, there's very different isotope ratios for primary producers in this littoral zone versus the pelagic zone. And this is one of the gradients that we can separate out these or characterize, say, these fish species are. OK, so we've got these beautiful clear water lakes, multiple different habitats within them, but it's a, a warming system, same as everywhere else. In fact, even more so than anywhere else, Lapland and that area of northern Europe is warming. It's one of the, the fastest warming areas on the planet. So we're seeing rapid changes in these lakes and they're quickly becoming things that look a lot more like this. This is like a what we would class as a, a turbid or a green state lake, say, where the majority of production is pelagic, very, very pretty more, much, much more productive system. And you'll see down here a different community, certainly of, of fishes. We've got things like rough, we've got some cypronids, perch here and, and pike more cool adapted species say than we see in the um, the clear water northern lakes and this isn't a a dramatic phase shift change this is a change that's happening gradually through time and one of the the first things we start to see is a, a range shift in some of these species as the conditions become more favorable to them further north they're found further and further north and particularly of concern or of interest for, for this study, say, is this species here, the Eurasian perch. And it's a, a generalist species. It'll forage, it'll feed on zooplankton, it'll feed on invertebrates. When it gets to around about 20 centimeters in size, typically it will shift and become piscivorous and will start feeding on other fish. So a, a real example, a really nice example of a, of a generalist species. And the work that I was involved in, work I was doing when we were in Finland, working with uh, Chris Harrod and Kimo Kahalainen, was looking at um, trophic interactions between some of these different species and eventually blew this out to look at entire food webs and things like that. But for the purposes of this demonstration, we're really going to look at how these two species, so we've got the, Euro the whitefish, typically a generalist, feeds on some zooplankton, some benthic invertebrates, but is starting to come in, in contact with this, with this perch, and the perch is almost, we could almost consider it an invasive species. So one thing we want to understand is when perch arrive, how are they segregating resources with whitefish? The whitefish, we think both whitefish and perch are, are generalists, so are they both going to sit somewhere in between the pelagic and the littoral? component in terms of their, their position on, a, on an isotope biplot, in terms of their, their isotope ratios. Or we know they're both generalists, they both feed on, um, on plankton sometimes. So perhaps when we've got a, that plankton boom, do both species shift to feed on plankton? Or are they predominantly benthic? How are they segregating resources? And this will allow us to sort of understand the mechanisms through which if we perch are taking over a system or becoming established in a system, what's the, the trophic impact of that on, on whitefish in terms of niche overlap or competition? Um, similarly, we can say, okay, are they completely separate? Do whitefish become more pelagic whereas perch are, are more benthic? So we, we don't know. And these are the, the questions that we were trying to figure out in, in Finland. And one of the other issues with this is not all lakes are the same. So we looked at this in, in deep water lakes and in shallow water lakes. Because in the deep water lakes, we have these three distinct habitats that we talked about, where we have the, the littoral, pelagic and the deep water profundal. Whereas in a shallow water lake, we don't have that. It's entirely pelagic or it's entirely littoral, excuse me. So that means that we've got all the lake bed or the vast majority of the lake bed is above that compensation depth. So we have 
a sufficient light to fuel photosynthesis throughout the lake. So when we're looking at how these species are segregating resources, we're interested in whether they're segregating resources differently in deep water lakes, where perhaps there's a, a pelagic um, refuge for, from competition for these whitefish, that the perch will dominate the littoral, whitefish go more pelagic. If we look in a shallow water lake, whitefish don't have that opportunity to, to segregate um, resources. So maybe we might expect to see more overlap and then there's a really interesting system in some of these lakes where the whitefish have actually radiated to produce these um, pelagic specialist whitefish in some of these deeper lakes. And how does that influence the interactions? We won't really touch on that. We're more so looking at this interactions between deep water systems and um, shallow water systems. And all of this comes from a, a paper that we wrote geez, this is nearly, ne nearly 10 years ago now, which is a bit scary. Um, with, uh, with Chris Howard and Kimo Kahalainen. And that was really trying to get a handle on how lake size influences the interactions between these species. So if you're interested, I'll share that link, or a link to that paper as well, or share that paper as well, and you can have a read of that and give you some more background. The paper is built off, I think there's maybe 10 or 12 lakes in overall. For this example, we're really just going to focus in on two of those lakes. We have one deep water lake, one shallow water lake, both of those lakes contain work perch and whitefish. And we're going to ask four kind of questions of this data. And this is sort of how these little data videos will be broken up and we will run through them. One of the first things we're going to do is we want to know whether whitefish and perch are segregating resources. Are they overlapping or are they using different resources within, within the lake? Then we want to say, how does lake size influence this segregation? Are they doing different things in deep water lakes than they do in, in shallow lakes? Next, we want to say, what's the, is there a difference in the isotopic niche among these species uh, using the, the cyber thing stuff? And again, how is that affected by lake size? And when I talk about isotopic niche, really here we're talking about niche, niche breadth. Does one of them have, is one of them a specialist, is the other a generalist, things like that. And then finally, we'll look at the um, differences in isotopic food web metrics among lakes. And if you've heard of things like the Lehman metrics, which we'll talk about in some of the lectures, that's where that's going to come in. OK, so we're going to work through this through a series of steps and a series of little videos, and you'll find all of these together, hopefully in one place, and we'll talk about them during the course. Okay, excellent.